I'm Wendell, this is Level 1 at PenguinCon, and I gotta do a quickie interview with Eric Kramen. Gotta ask him a few questions about Risk 5 and all the cool stuff. So, thought you might enjoy. It's a little informal, my audio is not the best, but hey, Eric Raymond is in rare form, as always. Enjoy. So, what do you think about Risk Five? I am very excited about it. Uh, I was late to the party. I only uh, really realized that Risk Five existed in maybe three, four months ago. Uh, but when I did look at it, the technology I think is very clever, but the the product management, their their strategy for propagating Risk Five, is utterly, absolutely brilliant. They have learned the lesson of of past technology disruptions, and I, I think they're executing one perfectly. So we were talking a little bit earlier, and you said it was a disruption from the bottom. Yes. Can you talk about, a little bit more about what you mean by that? This terminology comes from um, Christensen's book, The Innovator's Dilemma, where he talks about how um, established companies can, uh, with what he calls sustaining tra uh, technologies, can get ambushed, dry gulched, by uh, startups disrupting them. And he describes several different kinds of disruptions. And of these, the most characteristic is disruption from below, where you, and his classic example was the disk drive market, which uh, underwent several different disruptions. And each time, for example, when uh, eight inch, uh, uh, drives were disrupted by five inch ones, for example. You would start with some uh, tiny company producing smaller, lighter, cheaper drives that weren't as reliable and didn't have the performance that were required by people in, who were buying the established eight inch technology. But, and what they would do is they would attack niche markets first, places where cost was all important, where weight was all important, and the, the engineering trade-offs were such that people could live with lower reliability and higher per unit cost. And then they would use the money from those initial niche markets to, to fund incremental engineering improvements, which would gradually make the disrupting technology better and better and better until at some point it crosses over the uh, the uh, price per unit of uh, merit of the existing technology, the sustaining technology, and then the sustaining technology just collapses. Uh, and another classic example is uh, traditional mini computers versus PCs versus the descendants of the IBM PC. There was a, a whole scale disruption that went on in the early 1990s, which is why you don't see mini computers anymore. It's all PC descended technology. And I look at uh, Risk Five, especially vis-a-vis -vis ARM, and I think it's got to suck to be a product strategist at ARM these days because those guys are smart. I've, I have a lot of respect for ARM. They have good tech. They have smart business strategy. They've, they've, I mean, they've made mistakes. Every company does, but they have a record of very good planning and very good execution. And they're smart enough to know that Risk Five is executing a. a disruption from below on them and I don't see that there's anything they can do about it. They're kind of trapped. Do you think that it's going to take several iterations of the replacements uh, at the edge before we see desktop adoption like risk fives everywhere uh, but you know we have low power computers like Chromebooks and then all of a sudden we've got risk five on the desktop because of Chromebooks? That's I mean that's the classic way it works out. You know, it's 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 it looks the classic thing of uh, disruption from below, the technology looks niche and minor until the moment it break out. <laughs> but it's always difficult to predict in advance when the breakout moment will happen because it depends on a phenomenon that uh, nobody can really see. If you're doing a sustaining technology, your incentive is always to gold plate your tech so it's, it has better performance, uh, more speed, and more cost. But at some point, what happens is you overshoot the, uh, the performance that your users actually want to pay for, leaving you open to being disrupted by 
another technology that's just good enough. <laughs> and the thing is that that crossover point is very difficult to spot in advance. Nobody knows what that's going to happen because it's all revealed preferences. It's all things you can only elicit by watching market transactions. Has there been any technology that you've seen in the last six months or a year or so that you've gotten genuinely excited about? Uh, as much so as about Risk V. Um, or more. Well, some of the things happening in displays now are pretty cool, but that's all incremental improvement. That's, that's not a disruption the way Risk V is. I can't really think of anything else in the last six months, no. You know, uh, you are a prolific reader, and I've got a whole laundry list of books that uh, I have to go back and sort of read and learn about. Is, is there anything from your reading list that you'd like to share, or seminal works that you always go back to? Anybody who hasn't read Nassim Taleb's books, especially Anti-Fragile, should go read them now. <laughs> Uh, because his stuff about how we mismanage risk and misestimate probabilities and especially about the pervasiveness of the planning fallacy, that's really important. That sounds like that would be important for software engineering, but also maybe just living. For living, it also has major implications for our, our politics, which is saturated with planner's fallacy mistakes. <laughs> Is there anything you can share for people that are, let's say, technology enthusiasts, but uh, they haven't found their way yet, they don't know if they're going to be hardware or software or systems in engineering, and they know that technology is going to be a factor in their lives, and it's not really that we want to tell them explicitly what to do, but... Go play with a Raspberry Pi. <laughs> Think of something neat to do with it, and then notice whether the hardware side or the software side is what engages you most. Or maybe what interests you is the whole picture, the systems integration. Or automation, or program management, or... Well, I mean, you could write a kernel that would run on a Raspberry Pi if you want to live dangerously. Yeah, it's true. It's true. So uh, there's low-cost low hardware, and there's ecosystems of software out there that is intended to support experimentation. Use that. Dive in. Hack. Have fun. <laughs> We were talking earlier about uh, Go and Rust um, in, the, in the context of writing a device driver. And suddenly I'm, I'm getting an itch to do a Raspberry Pi kernel. You know, I was like, hey, this is the first Go kernel for the Raspberry Pi. Uh-huh, yeah, I think... <laughs> well, I mean, I think actually Rust would probably be a better fit for that. <laughs> Rust is uh, very safe, but it's got a little bit of a learning cliff. Yeah. That is a little bit of a high barrier to entry. I, oh, really high. I would choose, uh, given the choice of tools, I would choose Rust for device drivers, uh, firmware, kernels, anything with a hard real-time requirement. I would choose Go for anything that's like a service daemon, traditional internet service thing. Do you think there's any room for any sort of transformational development? on the desktop. Like you see, Linux is pretty much everywhere, except the desktop. But it seems like there is some opportunities for transformational changes on the desktop. But I don't know what that might be. I do. Smartphones. Smartphones are gonna eat the desktop. Docked smartphones are gonna eat the desktop. That could be. I've been working on that, level one KVM. I think the operating system is, well, the operating system's fine, it's, the kernel's fine, but uh, I think the reins are going to have to be loosened a little bit on the operating system. Yeah, it's true. But the potential is definitely there. All we need to do is uh, people who care enough about the software engineering to do it. And that we've got enough hard hardware that runs at a low enough power that we can, you know, have a reasonable experience. Have you seen some of the approaches like with Big Dot Little or, you know, like the thing where you run a program on, uh, you know, powerful cores and then it'll migrate to the low power cores and then migrate back to the high power cores? I know about that. I haven't actually used it myself. But yes, that is an interesting approach to take. I wonder if that's going to become a normal design pattern if we move to ultra, de you know, mobile devices. 
I think there's so much money going into power optimization, though, that I, the big little hack is probably temporary until we get better at the hardware design. That's my guess. It's a weekly confirmed guess. Yeah, AMD is running some stuff now where you know everything runs perfectly fine at five watts. But if you ramp it up to thirty-five watts, you get quite a bit more power, but you know more horsepower. But uh, it's not a linear improvement. So uh, you've been a Python developer for pushing twenty years. It's got to be right. Over, over twenty years at this point. So you've been around for the transition from Python two to Python three, and you know, can you share some experiences with that? And when you think about Python for the future, you know, in the context of like Go and Rust. What do you think? One of the realities that's making me sad right now is that I'm having to leave Python behind. Um, it makes me sad because I've been a Python developer t for 20 years. I love Guido and the gang around him. They're good people. They do good work. Uh, I've gotten a lot of use out of Python. I've gotten a lot of pleasure out of it. Um, but it, I think its day is passing. And the reason its day is passing is it's got... And uh, it, there's a, something wired into its architecture, which is called the global interpreter lock. And what it means is that you can't do effective parallelism uh, on Python unless you have frequent I.O. and network stalls sort of pre-chunking the, the data flow for you. If you're trying to do lots of computation in core and you want to parallelize it, you can't do it in Python. In fact, the uh, effects of contention on the interpreter lock are so bad that for that kind of computation what you really should do is power down all of your cores and only use one of them because you get you get a, a worse than linear loss of performance on multiple cores it's really terrible uh, uh, David Beasley did a video about this you can find on YouTube it's, it's scary how bad it is um, so I think Python is in inevitably going to be displaced by other languages. I, the, the obvious thing to displace it is Go, which is in many ways looks like a sort of Python C hybrid that, that takes on many of the virtues of both. Um, and I'm moving a lot of my work to Go these days. I, and I will still write Python for things that only have to, to, to react at human speed. But for anything that's uh, uh, processor intensive enough that it needs to parallelize, Python simply isn't a good bet, and it, it's it's not going to be a good bet in the foreseeable future because the dev team the dev team does not seem to be willing to pay the cost and complexity and breakage required to fix that GIL problem. I've been following the NTPSec project for uh, for a long time, and I always thought the use of, of Python in NTPSec to basically chip away at all the uh, the user interface parts was really clever, but can you talk a little bit more about that? Because you haven't really ported NTPSec from Python, it's just the user interface parts. Right. So yeah, when we uh, when we forked the NTP reference implementation, it was all in C. Well, no, it wasn't all in C. It was in this mostly in C, and minor parts of the, in the, the code were in this melange of shell and TCP and a couple of other archaic languages. And from a maintenance point of view, it was just a mess. It was a disaster. So one of the early strategic decisions I made in consensus with my senior developers was we're gonna minimize the number of languages in the suite because we need to get rid of that maintenance friction. And the first major step was we're, we're getting rid of all the C client code and we're replacing it with Python. So now we have this sort of split level organization where the core daemon itself is in C uh, and all of the client stuff is in Python. And this actually works extremely well because the, the, the differentiating factor is the clients only have to respond, they only have to operate at human speed. Only the core daemon itself, the NTP synchronization daemon, uh, needs to react with machine speed and precision and therefore that's the piece we've left in C. I think strategically down the road probably what's going to happen is that we're going to re uh, re first replace the Python stuff with Go and then eventually replace the C stuff with Go as well. Uh, but for now it's two languages. And this isn't the first time that I've seen you employ this kind of a strategy you know with respect to code management on a project. Like with uh, 
GPSD was another situation where maybe there's a lot of code and cruft and leftover stuff. Uh, not really, not on G Well, okay, I see what you mean. Function, it, it's not the case, the same case as MTPSEC, where, where there, there were a lot of old, weird features like superannuated drivers that didn't exist anymore. In GPSD, the problem was simpler. The problem was that the code had been written at a time when people were still preoccupied by portability to um, pre-standardization big iron Unixes that are now extinct. And there came a, a point in 2009 at which I was looking at all these if defs and I'm, I'm going, wait a second, we're gonna nev never going to run on AIX, not this code. We're, we're never going to run on BSD 4.2. What, this is going to run on a VAX? I don't think so, not with a GPSD attached to it, or not with a GPS attached to it. So I, uh, I, I made a, a, a bet. Uh, in effect, I said, I'll, I'll bet I can rip out everything that isn't C99 and single Unix specification version 2 conformant. I'll bet I can rip that stuff out and the world will barely, barely notice. And I did. And we got no pushback at all. And when you consider the deployment width of GPSD, the number of different platforms and systems, I mean, there's, GPSD is running in the U.S. Army's main battle tanks. It's in marine navigation systems. It's in driverless cars. It's everywhere. So the fact that we were that we were able to say, okay, C99 single Unix specification version two, that's it. That's our floor. The fact that we were able to do that and get no pushback at all tells you how completely the standards people have won. <laughs> and it was armed with that knowledge that I made the same decision for NTPSEC early on. Said, okay, we're chopping away, away all the old crap because it's a maintenance burden way out of proportion to any usefulness it might have at this late date. And that decision paid off too. Now I've also heard a rumor that you're working on a new book. Is there anything you want to talk about there? Sure, I can talk about that a little bit. Uh, it's, it's called um, The Programmer's Way, A Guide to Right Mindset. And it's doing the same sort of thing I did with the Art of Unix programming back around uh, 2005. It's a book about how to think like a master programmer, only it's not confined to the Unix design tradition, which is what I was really trying to talk about in that book. I, I'm trying in this book to give people a sense of, in order to do um, architecture and systems programming, how you have to learn to carve up the world with your mind is a good way to put it. Uh, I really mean it in the subtitle when I say a guide to right mindset. And what I've done is I've taken all, um, all the stuff I've written since then, uh, blog posts, uh, one or two technical papers for various venues, even IRC dialogues that I had with my apprentice. <laughs> Uh, I've taken on, I've edited these and I've added things that I've, I've learned since they were first written and I've assembled them into sections that have narrative arcs, that have themes. Uh, and uh, it's, it, I think it's turning into a pretty good book. And some interesting themes are emerging. In fact, I discovered one significant new unifying concept that had been lurking under a lot of the things I've been looking at. And that is. Uh, uh, reference locality and data structures. Reference locality in a data structure uh, is high when the things that are, that, are, that are semantically related are also close together in the representation so that you can look at all of them at once. Uh, the ultimate semantic locality uh, representation with good semantic locality is a database file in which each line is a record. Everything that's related to a particular entity and, uh, or record is on one line. You can just scan the fields and look at it. Uh, on the other hand, an example of a representation with very, very poor database, uh, uh, sorry, data structure locality, is a, da a, a database in the form that it's stored in a computer when you do lookups. Um, pieces have pieces of data have pointers to or implicit references to other things that are far away in the representation in such a way that it's difficult to even view the relationships without special tools and difficult to reason about them as well. 
And it turns out that this distinction between good versus poor uh, semantic locality in your data structures has all kinds of implications. One, th one is, how well does your problem parallelize? Generally speaking, if you have, if you can express the input data in your problem, the Fourier problem with data structures that have good semantic locality, then you will also be able to parallelize it effectively. If you can't, then you won't. Uh, and that is a sort of meta rule that only emerged in my mind after I looked at a bunch of my old essays on different topics that touched it. Uh, and, and I was able to make it explicit. Uh, and a, the, another theme is, um, it, it's a truism if you think about it that engineering is driven by economic trade-offs. It's all about uh, uh, surfing cost gradients and noticing when an approach has become more expensive than it's worth or when a new, uh, when an option has opened up that makes something that was formerly expensive cheap and that's the way you ought to design now. But uh, writing this book really kind of rubbed my nose and how important that is and how important it is that if you're going to do engineering effectively, you always need to keep the cost gradients behind your technology in mind. Well, I think that's going to be a good book. Hope so. <laughs> well, now, what about, uh, we, were, we were discussing before uh, defect attractors. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's also... A uh, concept that I've written about, and it, it's another central theme in the book. A defect attractor is what it sounds like. I picked up the idea from a uh, computer scientist named Les Hatton, who I'm a big fan of. He's done some very good work on looking at defect patterns in large code bases and identifying where we go wrong and exactly how. And one of his observations can be condensed by uh, the following statement. <clears throat> In object-oriented languages, class inheritance is a defect attractor. That is, if you look at defect patterns in large, co uh, large code bases, an unreasonably large number of point defects and bugs are clustered around places where people tried to use class inheritance and screwed it up. Uh, and I looked at that, and I, I, in my own mind, I generalized that, and I started thinking about what other kinds of things are defect attractors. And here are some obvious examples. Global variables are a defect attractor because they cause, they tend to cause data uh, leakage between modules. And once you've got the idea, and the thing is that the actionable advice that goes with noticing that there are such things as defect attractors is the, these are techniques that you either want to avoid using entirely or when you know you have to use them, Go to really heightened scrutiny. That's where you need to be paying attention in your troubleshooting and debugging. You need to be extra careful with that code. Uh, so one of the things I do in my book is I talk about different defect attractors and why they're defect attractors. And that means, man, don't go there if you don't have to. And if you do, be really careful. Try to architect your program such that the people that come after you won't introduce unintended side effects. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And the, the fewer defect attractors that you add, because defect attractors also, they tend to nucleate around each other. <laughs> <laughs> Where there's one defect attractor, the attempt to fix it will often spawn others. <laughs> Is there any parting advice that you would give to a younger, a younger but uh, enthusiastic audience that's you know highly mobile so don't forget to have fun that that drive to experiment uh, to try things to have fun to be playful that is what you'll will sustain your creativity over the long term don't lose that uh, that's a large part of what PingoCon's about is the cross pollination yeah. It's people like you and, and other people that are working in the industry can have these these conversations and sort of cross pollinate. Yep. Everybody say PingoCon. <laughs> PingoCon. <laughs> Every year coming away from PingoCon, I always feel like my reading list has gotten three times longer because Eric is a prolific reader. It's always really interesting his thoughts and perspective. So I'm looking forward to uh, getting through some of those reading assignments 
before next PangoCon. I'm Wendell, this is Level 1, and I'll see you in the Level 1 forums.